Um, no, I always love starting with a bit of a story and a bit of a... Uh, the last one that had a monkey, so I thought I'd change, change up this one. Um, so in terms of expecting the same sort of result every single time from what you're doing, if it's... Um, my old man always used to tell me, a, you know, tell me a joke and a story about the guy that goes to the doctor and says, doctor, doctor, every time I have a cup of tea, my eye hurts. And the doctor says, well, just take the, take the spoon out. Um, <laughs> So, are you doing something that's basically giving you the same result, but you can just be an easy fix, really? Or, well, you know, the, the most obvious thing, you know, ha, you know, will yield better results for you. So, um, in terms of gifted and talented students, they, um, there's, no, there's no one different, there's no definition, there's no one homogenous group. Not all gifted and talented kids are all the same. So, they're always going to va uh, vary in terms of their abilities, their... Is this the right? Okay, it does go off. Um, they do vary in their abilities and their aptitudes, um, either in one area, so in, in numeracy, or literacy, in, in reasoning, in logic, or it could be across a variety of domains. So there's no one thing of, as long as you know this, you know, you're automatically gifted and you, you're all the same. So this is why it's also quite hard to, to, to pinpoint or, or to test and, and to identify as well. Um, they also vary in their level of giftedness within, so even within the spectrum of giftedness, there's always going to be some differentiation there as well in terms of um, students who have gifts in the same field. They're not all necessarily going to have the same ability. So they might be gifted, two kids might be gifted in, in you know, logic reasoning or critical analysis, but the, the variation within their ability to do that is also going to be very, very different as well. So like another reason why, oh, another, not another reason, but another um, uh, point as to why it's a little bit harder to, to sort of pinpoint. Um, they vary in achievement in terms of um, in terms of their, their subjects, or just because you, you're good at math doesn't, or, you know, as a gifted kid, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be good at every single subject as well. Or just because you're good at English doesn't mean you're going to be good at every single subject as well. So um, I think there's a bit of a false conception of if a kid's smart, they should be getting A's in every single thing they do. But that doesn't, that's not the case. It shouldn't, it, it's not like that, okay? Um, because again, they've got varies, uh, it varies in terms of their abilities in the first place as well. Um, and there's a massive range of their personal characteristics as well. So um, a lot of them, uh, and I'll, I'll send you guys, a, a, there's a link embedded in there from um, a Canadian uh, professor called Lani Konevsky who does a lot of work with, with Gifted and Talented and she's, she's, it's a Creative Commons document, it's about, a, about 170 pages long um, and it's got a um, little checklist on how best to identify these students, um, they can do a self-assessment as well and different behaviours you can look for as well, so things like, um, but, you know, students who generally are gifted and or talented have a... Um, you know, a, a different sense of humour to everyone else, for example, and a, a different sort of self, sense of self-perception to everyone else as well. So there's a few little things that you can do is like a two-way street of you, you trying to, um, to, to, to identify them and them trying to identify themselves as well. So start simple. Do you guys do the ads in Queensland for Compare the Market? Good, okay. What's that, sorry? I see things. Okay, so start simple. Um, so, and, and this is, this is, a lot of this stuff that I'm going to show is actually good practice for everybody. You don't have to be gifted and talented to be able to, to, be able to uh, enjoy these. A lot of this is just good practice, period, as well. Um, now, I'll, I know that, you know, everyone always talks about pre-testing. However, for gifted students, it's quite, quite important because the last thing you need, or the last thing you want to do is, um, is, to, is to reduce that engagement that they already have. A lot of these kids already feel that people don't cater to them, so they just generally sit back and watch the watch the lesson go by, watch the world go by, just think, well, stuff's too easy for me because I'm, you know, I'm good at this. But the work I get is busy work. It's just, it's more work, not harder work. So it's not really, it's just keeping them busy for the teacher to then, I hope they're on, we've got 10 minutes to go. I don't really have a lesson plan, or like anything left for them for 10 more minutes. Can you catch up in any other work you've got to do for other, you know, that sort of stuff. So um, a lot of them just, they, they become apathetic in the end to a lot of the stuff that happens. Um, so, and this is just good practice. Pre-testing is just good practice. Now, because I'm New South Wales based, um, I'm sure that there's a Queensland equivalent. I did do a search earlier, but I couldn't find the exact document. However, we have something called the New South Wales Quality Teaching Framework in the public system. Um, and then all the other systems, dioceses, um, Catholic, independent, they all sort of mooched <laughs> off it and built their own thing together. It's basically, and um, this was done by people at University of Newcastle years ago, and a lot of jurisdictions have now used this as their thing of, this is what signifies quality teaching and learning um, in terms of really high knowledge, uh, deep knowledge, deep... And this is a lot of stuff that John Hattie's also sort of mentioned as being important as well. 
um, you know, the idea of deep knowledge, deep understanding, um, in terms of the rigor, uh, the rigor for the intellectual quality. So, um, if you want them to learn something and you want it to be rigorous, they need to know, or they need to have deep knowledge, deep understanding, um, they need to uh, question um, preconceived ideas, problematic knowledge, um, they need to incorporate higher order thinking, they need to, look at, they need to have meta language, and they need to be able to communicate quite well as well. Okay, so according to, to this intellectual quality, for quality learning environment, you need to have explicit quality criteria, which is, this is exactly what I want you to have done by the end of the lesson, or the exact, this is exactly what I want you to have, um, uh, what it should look like. So this could be, for example, a uh, success criteria for users, learning intentions and success criteria at your school, or it can even just be modelling. Um, one of my favourite things, and there's one here, mine's a lot less high tech, but a little visualiser. One of my favourite things is one of those little cam like little visualiser webcams. And when you're doing geographic skills, for example, you know, trying to do a, uh, a climate graph, for example, just chucking a piece of paper on and just saying, by the, you know, the end result is this is what it's going to look like. Just modelling. So they know what am I aiming for. Okay? Um, and also, but looking at, there's a lot of studies that show, it's also quite beneficial to say, but show them what not to do as well. Don't just say this is the best response there is, you need to try and emulate this. Show them as well what the poorest one looks like as well and say this is what you should not be doing as well. Um, and I do this quite regularly with my Year 12s uh, when we're looking at, um, at extended responses. Uh, you know, the, our, our state, NESA, uh, is quite good at providing work samples and saying, you know, sample responses, this is what a band 1 is, should be, this is what a band 2 is from actual past, not ones that the, you know, the people in the office write themselves, from past years of HSC exams, for example. So you can access that and say, well, this is what a band one got, or this is what got a band two, this is what a band three, and showing the kids to look at it and say, well, don't just look at what the best one got, look at the progression of what you need to add as you go from there to up there as well. So that's that, um, that's that quality criteria there. In terms of the engagement, having high expectations of them, but they also need to have some sort of, um, you know, they're not robots, they also need to be self-regulated and have some, some of their own direction, which is where flip learning comes in so well, because you've now got the time in class to really work on, essentially, that entire section about the rigour of, of the learning they're doing, because you've got time to do it, and also the idea of providing them with social support, letting them be self-regulated because they're able to work in a peer, you know, in a peer to peer environment, and having their own direction in how they're choosing to learn. And even, even though this was written, many, many years ago. There's a big push right now for the idea of student direction. Even as Steve mentioned in the keynote, for example, it was, you know, there's talk that they should, you know, Gonski says kids should really have their own individual learning plan, for example. So providing kids with their own direction of where they want to go with what they're learning, okay? Um, and then any learning they do, and I find this works really well with the whole idea of gifted and talented as well, any learning they have to do has to be significant. How, what, what are they doing it for? Is it just going to be uh, something they write in their book and then it gets closed up and then it never gets looked at ever again? Or is there some sort of real-world audience? Okay, whether it be... And it has to be... It's not just you know, a teacher. You know, I've, I've seen your thing. Well done. You can now pack up. But it's... Is it going to get put up on the screen at... Let me touch this before it goes away. Um, you know, is it going to be playing on a loop at your front office? So when every parent... You know, every parent carer or you know general person that walks in sees the work people are doing. So, what what kind of real world application is there? And again, this is why flip learning works so well because you've got the time to do this as well. So, the first that should have come in at the end, but um, one of the one of the first sort of you know strategies you can use to sort of enrich your gifted and talented kids is the maker model. Okay, um, now this is different to maker spaces. They're not physically making things. So, it's just by person called maker, not a maker space. Um, there are four things. I'm going to look at each of these four, uh, and I'm going to link it to uh, which one of those elements of, of the quality teaching framework it links best to as well. So in terms of, is this one going to hit, you know, the idea of rigorous, uh, rigorous content as opposed to authenticity, as opposed to um, my environment, okay? And already you can see that it's quite similar to, and as I said, a lot of this is just good practice as well. You might already be doing this so everyone's going to benefit from it regardless, even if they are or not identified as gifted. Everyone can benefit from this, okay? Um, so in terms of modifying the content, so are you able to accelerate students? Are you able to compact your curriculum in terms of cutting down the work from X amount of months, terms, semesters into something smaller for them as well because it's something that they can cover pretty well? Um, can you modify how complex the actual content is itself? 
Okay. Now I said it's not just more. It's not. It's not more work. It's it's you know harder work. Can you modify the process as well? So. Can you change the pace at which they are creating something? And I'm going to sort of link this into a sort of like a PBL type thing later on. Um, can you modify, change the higher order thinking skills? And this is something similar. I was even just at a business studies thing ages ago, and someone even just said, you know what, just going, just even for the higher order skills, not even just for gifted and talented kids, but for anyone, if a kid was writing a sentence, if they just add the word because, they've automatically moved up a scale in the higher order thinking. It's raining, full stop. That's a very low order. Because condensation makes the um, evaporation condenses, creates clouds, falls down as rain. So even just by adding the word because auto automatically modifies the process of what kind of, an what kind of question are they trying to answer here? And that's not even you doing it, that's them adding that word. And going even further, adding the word so. It's raining because X, Y, Z, scientific or geographic process, so it leads to X, Y, Z afterwards. So adding those two words in is enough to really extend that as well. Um, can you modify the product? Are they just putting together a flyer? Are they doing a, or are they doing, you know, are they creating a lot, a lot, a lot more of my colleagues and a lot more um, teachers I work with are creating things like podcasts as an actual assessment, as a summative task or a formative task. They're not just doing a poster that's just going to sit in the room once gets taken down because, you know, when that plan comes along, when exams come along, you've got to take everything off the wall so the kids can't read it or whatever it is. That post ends up in the bin or the thumbtacks get taken because thumbtacks are very rare to find in schools. Gets taken and go, use something else or the blue tack wears off or something and that post is gone. Or it's a flyer the kid submits, sits on your desk and then it ends up in, it gets filed appropriately, you know, in recycling or something later on. So can you modify, and in the maker model, can you modify the product? What are they actually going to end up with in the end, okay? And they're, and they're learning environments, so can you find a different way of grouping them? Instead of just saying, you know, go sit with your friends, and look, I, sit them, I see the merit in them working with friends because they need to feel comfortable with the people they're with as well. Um, but I think that also comes down to a bit of a culture thing in the classroom as well, trying to get them to break those little silos. Um, but can you group them by their ability levels? I know not many, you know, we're very good in collecting data. Let's use it for something worthwhile, okay, rather than it just sort of sitting on a spreadsheet. Um, so I've sort of tried to break it down as best I can with how it sort of fits with that. So can you, can you vary the level of abstraction? How, are you giving them too much at the start? Are you basically giving them the answer already before they started? Because they're going to end up finishing their work very quickly and then just sitting back and waiting. So can you modify how abstract and how complex the work is going to be in the first place? Don't give them everything already. Withhold a few bits of information. With, let, them, let them show you what they can do. Okay, let them show you what they can do. Can you, and this is in terms of content, can, can you modify, okay, the method of inquiry they use? Instead of, you know, just get onto Google, can they, and, and this works quite well in geography, because we do a lot of observations, a lot of field work as, as well. Can you, can you change the way that they do it? Rather than just go to the ABS website and find it, can you actually go out and do something yourself instead? Can you modify how you're actually finding that information in the first place? As I said, I'm cognizant of time and I just want to try and make sure um, we've got a bit of time at the end to sort of try and go through some of these. Um, now, the reason I've put that in red, is, uh, discovery learning, is it's, quite a, it's copped a lot of heat recently about kids, they shouldn't just be left to go off on their own if they have no background knowledge in the first place because then they're just not going to know what to do. So I've put that one in red because that one there's one of those ones where it's kind of like a... Take this one, you know, carefully. Um, I look... Kids are, you know, the scrubber learning is good. They can go off and, and, you know, learn something themselves by discovering it themselves for the first time. But if they've got no background knowledge, that could go very badly very quickly as well. If they've got nothing to sort of compare it to in the back of their head in terms of what it should be in the first place as well. So that's why I put it on red. It's a bit of a, yeah, be careful. Um, in terms of the process that they're going through to come up with an end result as well, can you modify things like what kind of proof and reasoning do they need to show you? Okay, what kind of statistics or what kind of, what kind of um, criteria are you letting them come up with their own criteria of this is, you know, the, this, is, this is the criteria I use to come up with my um, end result, for example, as opposed to the predetermined criteria that was already given to, uh, given to the students by the teachers in the first place. So rather than saying you need to show X, Y, Z, you'd be surprised. They'll be able to come up with their own. They, you, you know, the amount of times I've gotten stuff back from kids and gone, eh, I'm going to use that next time because I, I didn't even think of that. Okay, and they'll, they'll blow your mind some of the things these kids come up with. Um, in terms of freedom of choice, and um, pretty, as, as the name implies, allowing them to basically 
Bob, for themselves, allow, allow them to come up with, okay, well, how are we going to be finding this information? How are we going to be delivering it? How are we going to be um, collating it? How are we going to be communicating it? Okay, how the pacing as well. How are you modifying? Can you do this in the, you know, can you do this over the space of a month or a term or can you modify the pacing to let these kids, you know, can you accelerate it into, into basically one week, for example? Um, and given the option of, Interacting with the group, different simulations. I was in a session just before with Debbie before, um, and you mentioned a great idea about um, in the groups having a little projector around the room. Was that you that mentioned or someone in the session? Oh, perfect. There we go. I was in one of those sessions. And you know what? I think I'd love that because you can get a short throw projector off eBay for about 50, 100 bucks, and that could be at every kid's desk, and they can just sitting in their little group around the room and just a little short throw projector up on the wall, and they can just huddle together and do their own little group work that way rather than. You know, I think it's a great idea. That was that, that, as soon as you said that, I thought, I wonder if I can get a couple of those on eBay or something. That's amazing. That's a great idea. And that, that allows you to modify the process of how are they communicating? Are we just waiting for the kids at the end? Okay, by the end of today's lesson, this PowerPoint needs to be done. Start of tomorrow's lesson, we're going to be presenting. And everyone just presents at the same time. And it's just the kids that are, you know, the, the, the much more able kids, the gifted and talented kids, um, they've probably already finished. They've probably already been sitting in, the, in, in your room for about a week going, mm, we're done. What are we going to do? Why well, we need to wait for another three lessons or whatever it is to get this thing done? Okay? And I said, it's sort of, so it's kind of linked in with this idea of the intellectual quality. Um, the final product, so what they come up with in the end. Um, are they trying to solve a real world problem? I can guarantee you, you can probably find something wrong with the world right now that you can try and get them to fix. There's plenty of things wrong with the world right now. Plenty of things wrong. Okay? Politically, economically, socially, environmentally, um, economic, did I say economically? Uh, there's plenty of real-world problems, okay? Um, can you find a real audience for their product? Is it going to just sit in their book or is it going to get beamed into, um, you know, the school office, for example? Or is it something that's going to be sent through as part of the newsletter to more people than that? So, <coughs> excuse me. Who's the final audience for that? And are they going to have the opportunity to actually evaluate and reflect? And I know that we always love to think that we give kids a chance to reflect on their learning, but are they actually reflecting or are they just going, I don't like that activity? That's not reflecting, that's just them having an opinion about the activity. So the product in the end, having a built-in criteria to say, well, did it work? And this is, I'm going to try and go back without going too far. No, it's going to go too far back. Having the one about the, oh, actually, it's just there. Proof and reasoning. So it's built into that process as well of if, you give them the ability to figure out or tell you, this is how, this is the criteria I'm going to use to show you what I'm doing or what my end result's going to look like. You're then giving them the chance to evaluate later on as well. Okay? You said you're going to do X, Y, Z. Did you actually do X, Y, Z or not? And why? And what can you do later to fix it? That's a reflection, not uh, that activity wasn't that great. Okay? And that's linked to this idea of the significance of what they're doing. Okay, what connectedness do they have? <coughs> and then the learning environment modifications as well. And even in, uh, in, in, in Debbie's session then as well, it was you that mentioned this time in terms of things like flexible seating, for example. And a lot of, um, a lot of schools are now trialing, sorry, a lot of schools are trialing flexible seating. Um, so what, how are you changing your learning environment? So are the students able to pick their own groups? I know that, again, it's one of the tests of everyone joining their own group and they'll just go see with their mates or there's always one kid who's left by themselves um, and it's really awkward and hard to say, can you, can you join them? And do you guys mind having that kid? Because that always, always leads to a few, you know, awkward conversations. Um, so how are you choosing your group? So is it, is it data-driven? Is it interest-based? Um, how much independence do they have? How open, how flexible are they in being able to move around the actual room? Um, I've, I, in my ideal world, I'd love to have flexible seating. I'd love to have kids being able to go anywhere in the room they want. Um, you might be, you might, unlike, no, you might be lucky, but unlike me, I've got, I'm in about 19 different rooms across two weeks. So I, I can't even have wall displays because I've got to go to a different room for the same class later on, that sort of stuff. What's that, sorry? Yeah, so sometimes you, you go in and, you know, they're in rows and then you go to the next one, they're in a big horseshoe, then you go to the next one and they're in groups. And you thought, well, how are you going to sort of how are you going to sort of work around that because you don't know what you're going to get any day really. So how are you going to modify that learning environment to allow them to be basically the, the, the drivers of what they're trying to do here, okay? And that's linked to this idea of the quality learning environment. What, what social support are they receiving? 
How are they getting regulated? What sort of direct... Because again, if you start giving them the ability to choose their own groups, be a bit more flexible, be a bit more highly mobile, you're giving them the ability to self-regulate because they know, and it takes a while, but they know that, okay, the second this kid next to me starts talking about football, I'm go I know that I'm going to start... I'm, I know that I'm not going to do anything for the next 50 minutes. So it, by you giving those high expectations of this is what we expect in the class, it hopefully, and it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight, but hopefully they end up self-regulating and knowing what they can and can't get away with once they're in groups, okay? Um, we've also got this thing called the Kaplan model. It's quite similar to the Maker model, where it looks like, it looks like the idea of uh, process, product, and a learning environment, but it does it in a much more uh, holistic way because gifted, talented, uh, gifted students tend to be a bit more holistic. They don't just sort of focus on, you know, I've solved this one problem, um, you know, this, this minute problem. They tend to be a bit more um, bigger picture, type thing, uh, so they, they tend to learn a bit more holistically. So um, they, the capital model, what this one here does is it focuses on a major issue, so you're not going to you know, give them a project uh, that's very narrow. It'll be something, and the example I've got later on is something like plastic pollution, um, which we do in Year 9 Geography, for example, with environment change and management and sustainable biomes. I'm not sure what it might be called in Queensland. I think it might be biomes produce food. I think the unit might be called in Geography, for example. Um, but you have a much more holistic overarching unit instead or, or concept, okay? Um, and they're going to be drawing, in this model here, the Kaplan model, they're going to be drawing from a much larger knowledge base. So it's, again, very, very broad here. The Kaplan model also, because it's very holistic, you're able, and I love, I love the science department at my school, um, and I love the PAS department at my school, because I can always guarantee you that there's going to be some, any day of the year, or any day of the week, any week of the year, there's going to be some time where we can overlap. Okay, looking at plastic pollution, I can guarantee you that DNT is doing some sort of STEM project to get the kid, and they actually did, to try and invent something to clear up plastic pollution. Or I know science is going to be doing um, plate tectonics one day, and I know that it's going to... I can always guarantee that science and TAS are doing something that's going to interrelate with geography in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Um, so it allows you to basically, also in this couple of models, allows you to draw in uh, curriculum from different subjects as well, different subject areas. Okay? Make this a bit more, as we said, bit more of a major issue and a bit more holistically as well. Really focuses in on, on in-depth research and not just teaching them um, what to think, but also how to think. So the idea of thinking skills. And if you've ever been to one of, um, <coughs> one of Ryan Gill's talks ever in terms of the cultures of thinking, um, it's amazing in terms of teaching kids how to think. Um, so he really looks at how, how do you get them to think, okay? Um, and the difference with a lot, a lot of other models is you don't really start, I hate to use the word at the bottom, but you don't really start down the bottom end of blooms and then work your way up. This is much more aimed to, let's just start hitting the, the, you know, the harder stuff straight away. Okay? The, it's assumed that the kids are quite strong, so there's no point. Don't infantilise them, don't patronise them, saying, can you remember what the year was when you know, Captain Cook arrived? Don't, just go straight to the higher order stuff instead. Okay? Um, it's a, lot more, it's a lot more difficult and the pace is picked up as well. They might have a shorter time frame to work on this as well. But it's very student-centred. Okay? So, for example, the big, theme con the big theme or the concept, very generic, very wide-based plastic pollution. Okay? Very, very broad. You, you know, you'd put in, and I left this on blank because I wasn't sure what it would be in Queensland, um, whatever your appropriate state or territory outcome is, you know, G1.4 or G5.7 or whatever it might be. Okay? Um, what kind of research skills are they going to have? So... How are they going to? Well, what kind of criteria are they going to be? Uh, are they going to be creating for them to? And again, you get them to do it themselves. Co-creating is fine, where you, you work with them and say, well, what do you think will will and won't work? Can we work on it? But allowing the students the, the ability and the freedom to be able to say, okay, well, this is the criteria we're going to use to judge, and this is the evidence we're going to use to then prove it. Okay, this is the proof and reasoning I was talking about. Okay, so we're going to use X, Y, Z to judge, and this is going to be basically the data we're going to hopefully receive to be able to prove that. Okay, um, what are they going to be? What are the productive skills? What, what are they actually going to be learning in the in order to come to the end product? And I will be looking at something called Genie Sale later on, which which uh, I've done with non commerce, which has worked really really great with some of those kids that really wanted to be pushed. And the kids that didn't know they wanted to be pushed, they ended up getting put. That sounds really weird. They end up getting pushed anyway. Okay, in a good way. All right, so. What skills? Okay, so we're going to learn problem solving, we're going to learn analysis. Uh, and then finally, the end product. What's it going to be? Multimedia presentation? Are they going to create a web page? Are they going to create a podcast? Are they going to create an actual physical prototype? 
your school might be lucky enough to have um, you know, things like 3D printers or laser cutters, for example. Can they come up with an actual tangible product, for example? Okay. They love naming these things after themselves. Very good. Williams. Um, so in the Williams model, for example, it allows you to infuse the pro and, and throughout a lot of these slides, I've included the hyperlinks to sort of, um, uh, not worksheets, but uh, uh, templates and, and sort of breakdowns of how you can draw, oh, not draw, but how you can, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the best word, how you can implement into your, into your programs through you know, the templates I've given you, et cetera. Um, so for the Williams model here, the, this one's got 18 strategies. Uh, and I'm gonna go through, I know it's gonna sound tedious, but I'm gonna throw each one an example of what you can do as well, okay? So um, in order to get them to think, again, getting them to stretch their thinking, okay? So for example, very first one is, I think of a paradox. So for example, national identity, and this is gonna be very Australian, like Anzac and globally based, National identity comes from glorious defeat. Or does it? So offer them a paradox. Okay, because it's very easy for kids to say, yes, but what if it doesn't? Can you come up with the can you come up with a counter argument there? Okay? Um, very simple as well. Can you just list the act? What is an Australian? Even if I ask you right now, what is it? What is an Australian? What makes an Australian? Can you even answer that? It sounds very simple, but what is it? See it might seem simple attribute listing, but can they actually come up with something that answers that question for you? Um, what about an analogy? How was Australia Day like Anzac Day? Can you find any links? How are they like each other? Can they find, can they, can they poke holes in an argument? What's the discrepancy? Can they, can, what, can they poke holes in an argument like, for example, so what did Federation actually hope to achieve in the first place? And then, did they? Where's that criteria? Did they end up doing it? Okay. Um, a nice provocative question in the Williams one as well. Is Anzac Day an appropriate symbol for a multicultural country? Okay, in year nine, my own history class, I gave something very similar to that was, is, Anzac, is the Anzac legend relevant today? With reasoning, with proof and reasoning, why, why not? Can they provide you examples of change? So, if they actually landed in a different spot, would it be different? Kind of like the whole big what if question. So, what if they, what if they landed in a different spot? How would it be different? What if it didn't? you know, get used as fodder by the English, for example. Um, looking at habits that people have. So for example, so what traditions are there with Anzac Day? So what kind of things are people basically used to doing now? What things, what things do people do that are so ingrained in a culture or tradition? What about some things that are a bit ambiguous? A nice provocative question again. So nurses saved humanity, but technically they were also helping the war continue by saving those people. Yes or no? Do you agree to that? Because technically, by helping those people get better and get back on the battlefield, they'll prolong the war. If they just let them die, no more soldiers, war over. I've put this in red because I'm not a big fan of this one, even though it, it is one of, you know, I, I'm not going to delete someone's work. I'm not a big fan of an empathy task. Um, this is sort of like an intuitive expression. You know, pretend you're on the beaches of Gallipoli. What will be going through your mind? I'm not a big fan of empathy tasks. Just because you don't, you can never, you, you don't know what the context is. You can't put yourself in the shoes of someone else. It's, it's culturally, socially, psychologically, politically inappropriate for me. I don't know. I just, that's just me. Okay? Getting the kids to do an empathy task of, you know, um, pretend you're one of the first Australians. What will be going through your mind when you saw the ships arrive? No, no. That's really... No, don't do that. No. What's that, sorry? Well, that's what I mean. If you saw that as a kid, you'd be like, no. no. You know, I don't like empathy tasks. Um, has anyone ever used Genie Sour before? You don't have to dedicate an entire lesson to it. You can also make this as a side hustle for the kids once they're done as well, rather than just, oh, can you catch up on any other work you need to catch up on from other subjects? It's, you can work on like a rolling genius hour as opposed to a predetermined, it's gonna happen now, okay? Um, so they come up with basically this whole big picture. So this, this fits in quite well with, with that Kaplan model of the broad overarching thing of we want, to, we want to try and solve a global problem, or, or um, it could be a local problem, but um, you know, like on a big scale. We had, uh, uh, in Nine Commerce, where because uh, it's an elective as well, the kids generally want to be there, so they're a bit more motivated, a bit more engaged in the content in the first place, as opposed to um, you know, subjects where you know, they're forced to be there. Um, you know, as Steve showed in his, um, in his keynote as well, you know, the, the scene from Ferris Bueller where the teacher's just you know, you know, droning on. Um, 
So in terms of uh, in terms of in terms of Genie Sour, it gave them the ability to come up with an idea of what they wanted to change in the world, come up with their own criteria of how am I going to know that it works or what am I going to try and hope for? And if I don't end up with the finished product, what skill would I have learned in the first place? So I had students say, you know, I've never learned how to make a website. I'd love to learn how to code a website. No, I've got no idea how to code websites. I've got no idea. Um, so, you know, learn how to code a website. Or one said, you know what? There's a lot of homeless people in Australia. I'm going to come up with basically like, almost like a little gift card type thing where they have and people can pretty much donate to that card via an app and that means that they don't, if they don't have any cash and do the awkward, I don't have any money, when you walk past them, you can just sort of scan a little code and send them five bucks so they can go get themselves a coffee or food or something. They said, look, the skill, I'm, even, if, even if by the end of the year I've run out of time to be able to do the, you know, end up with the final product of having a little prototype plastic card and making the website, the skill I want to learn is how to code and how to, you know, boost my graphic design skills. So using things like Canva to make the logo for the app, for example. So in the end, when they did their showcase to the rest of the class, even if they said, look, I failed because I didn't finish it, they can still say, but by my criteria, I still learnt my skill that I was going to do. So I still achieved a goal. Okay, I still achieved a goal. And they ate it up. They love this. We're very familiar with Blooms and how John flips Blooms and makes uh, creating up the top as opposed to down the bottom. Uh, sorry, as opposed to remembering happening in the, in the class and now um, you know, analysing, evaluating, creating is up. So if you're in my last session, now's the time to sort of, I guess, disengage. No, I'm joking. Stay, stay away, please. <laughs> stay away. Um, so dovetail out of what we're talking about. Um, I love visual puns. It's visual literacy. Yeah. Um, it's a dovetail. Um, gridiron. I love football. I love American football. Um, so one of the ways I love to sort of extend the kids a little bit more as well, using that, is using gridiron. It's kind of like... I mean, look, the poor brother of gamification, I guess, because it doesn't really happen. To, it's not flashbang. Okay, it just happens. It's very, it's very simple. Um, if you're not familiar with gridiron, uh, the field is it's about 100 yards long and it's broken into 10 by 10 yard segments. So what happens is the team, you know, the aim for the offense is to move the ball up the field and score, and they do that in 10 yard increments. So once they've made that 10 yard minimum, they can then move to the next 10 yard block, and once they've made that 10 yard minimum, they can then move to the next 10 yard block. Okay. They get four attempts, or what they call downs, to do those 10 yards. So they get four attempts at hitting that 10 yards. They get it within that four attempts, they can move to the next 10-yard block, and they slowly move themselves up the field. So, and that's what it looks like, basically. So what I've done is, I've, I've and this, this was born out of uh, about nine, nine years ago when I was doing uh, my prac teaching at an all-boys school in, in quite a low to middle socioeconomic sort of area where the boys were very, very in need of something, you know, active. Um, so what I've done is basically synthesise it with blooms. So what it ends up looking at is... Uh, let me just quickly go to the thing. So, for example, a, a map of the, of the field, for example, you start with the lower form of... See you later. That's no, it's okay. We're almost done anyway. They're wrapping me up as well next door. Um, very, very similar. So that you start with the lower order stuff and they're slowly working their way up the field to the much more higher order Bloom's work. And they get those four attempts to hit that 10 yard block and then move to the next one. It's a built-in formative assessment task as well for them. So with some of the kids that are gifted, you, like we said before with, with Williams and Capital Model, you just start straight there as opposed to there and working your way up. But that's what I said. A lot of this is good practice where the kids can get pushed up as well with them. Um, so back to the presentation. All right, um, the scamper model, and this is hyperlinked. Uh, can they substitute something? So can you remove some part of the situation and replace with something else as part of your, as part of the, as part of the product? Okay. So can you substitute something? Can you combine things together in terms of with the problem? So in terms of plastic pollution, can you substitute something? and replace with something else in order to solve your problem of, plastics, uh, of plastic pollution. Can you combine things together? Can you adapt or change some parts so it works somewhere now where it didn't work before? Can you modify something? So keep it as it is, but tweak the attribute a little bit. What's the purpose 
of the whole, you know, puts her on the use of the actual uh, subject as well. Why does it exist? What's it even used for? What's it supposed to do? Okay, what new purpose can we come up with for your product that you're trying to solve? Uh, uh, for the, the product that you're using to try and solve the problem? Can you eliminate things? And this works well with the very last thing I'll look at in a second, which is if you're at my last one, you would have heard about, about turn your eyes, uh, turn your eyes, thinkers keys. You know, can you change the orientation? Can you turn it upside down? Can you make it go backwards? So can you basically, in a way, basically just flip your product all over again to try and come up with a better solution? Another great acronym, GRASP. Um, in this one here, you'll start a project. So this works quite well with PBL. So you start the project with, what's the actual goal gonna be? What are you trying to achieve? What are you gonna achieve by the end of it? Okay, what are you gonna achieve by the end of it? What role do people have? Now it needs to reflect the goal in real life. So it wouldn't be, well, you can be the person that puts together the PowerPoint and you can be the person that goes to Google because that, we know that doesn't happen in real life. I've not gone to a bank or I've not gone to, to anywhere and sat down and someone's pulled out a Google Doc and the next person next to them is the person that finds the images and emails it to. It doesn't work like that in real life. So what kind of goal, uh, sorry, what kind of role are they going to have in real life to try and solve that problem? Okay? And I think this is where the, um, I think this is where like that short throw projector thing will work really well because the kids can sort of huddle around and, you know, work through things a lot more collaboratively as well. Um, Make it real world. Make it authentic. Who's the audience? Who's it going to be for? Who's going to be seeing it? Okay. What are you actually trying to fix? Plastic pollution? Are you trying to come up with a new product? Business studies works really well for this when we do marketing campaigns. Come up with a new fragrance aimed at men aged between 13 and 18. Okay. Um, and then finally, what are you going to actually make? Brochure, commercial, 3D model. Okay, a little tactile object maybe. And then finally, as the bell goes, the, there's no bells, as the thing winds up, as I said, it, it's like Pavlov's dog. I'm, over the holidays, I'm surprised I can go to the bathroom when I want and the bell goes and I go to I walk to the next room of my house when the bell goes and it goes again, I walk to the next room. 